We'll begin. Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Markham. I'm a fellow in the governance program here at the R Street Institute. Thank you for joining us on, if you're in the DC area, a very nice spring-like day, but for our March meeting of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, a project here run by the R Street Institute. Now, before I talk about our subject today and introduce our panelists, I do want let, um, want um, people to know that our events are recorded and can be found on our website, ledgebranch.org, or on our home website, rstreet.org. For people interested in this event, event, Ledge Branch will be a useful resource and a place of interest for many of you. The site hosts a diverse range of articles, studies, reports, all about Congress, what's working, what's not working, and ideas on how we can potentially fix it. With that perspective, I think today's event is cer certainly timely. Our discussion is about government accountability and positive bipartisan avenues for the 117th Congress. This is an important issue to discuss because there's a growing sense that government accountability is unfortunately decreasing. A lack of transparency often leads to a lack of trust. When important democratic institutions like Congress lose basic trust, people turn elsewhere for help. And that can set a dangerous foundation to empower undemocratic und ideas and undemocratic institutions. The same goes for when Congress historically ignores looming issues like debt and growing deference to the executive branch. In short, we need government institutions, including Congress, to be more accountable to the public. And to help us learn a more about that today and offer some reasonable paths forward, we have three great panelists here to join us. The first is Lisa Rosenberg. Lisa is the executive director of Open the Government. She is an expert in transparency and government issues and her, her career in public service includes a decade advocating for transparency to promote accountability at the Sunlight Foundation, launching many of the organization's advocacy initiatives. Her work also includes addressing campaign finance reform for Senator John Kerry, also served as counsel for the Center, Senate Governmental Affairs Committee Special Investigation into Federal Election Activities. She additionally was director of the FEC Watch Project at the Center for Responsible Politics and senior director for public policy at NAFSA, Association of International Educators. Next is Ann Tyndall. Ann is counsel at Protect Democracy. She most recently served as assistant general counsel for litigation and oversight at the US Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, representing the agency in federal courts and before Congress and other oversight bodies. Before that, she worked in private practice, conducting internal investigations and representing companies and pro bono clients in district court and appellate litigation. She also served as counsel to the House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce during the passage of landmark healthcare, financial reform and environmental litigation. Finally, we have Andrew Louts. Andrew is the director of federal policy for the National Taxpayers Union. In this role, Andrew works with stakeholders on and off the Hill to promote pro taxpayer health, tax and regulatory policy. Andrew also helps lead NTU's work on Pentagon spending, government transparency, and congressional reform. Before joining NTU, Andrew conducted research for a number of political and issue advocacy campaigns. Andrew has been kind enough, I wanted to know, to participate also in our Pentagon Purse String series, which I also recommend it's hosted here at the R Street Institute. And as a quick, quick plug for that, I believe this Thursday, Andrew and our R Street's Jonathan Bidlack We'll also be talking to Lisa Hirschman, who was previously chief management officer of the Pentagon. So I think that discussion of the Pentagon purse string series will also be an interesting view for people. So with that, I wanna turn it over to our, finally to our panelists. And I think it's fair to, to start with Lisa. And really a lot of this and a lot of the inspiration for this event stems from Open the Government's Accountability Report titled Accountability 2021, Recommendations for Restoring Accountability and the federal government. And in the report's executive summary, it summarizes what it means to have an accountable government. And it begins with succinctly, I think, people having access to all government information necessary to hold government accountable. So with that in mind, when it comes to a more open government, what are some of the most obvious blind spots today? In other words, what are areas that transparency advocates are most loudly pointing out and saying, look, Congress or the executive branch this is where we're fundamentally failing to provide sufficient information. Uh, thanks, Anthony. And I wanna make one sort of slight clarification of what you said. Open the government convened 30 or so organizations across the political spectrum through most of 2020. 
um, to create the accountability 2021 recommendations. So we can't take credit for the entire uh, blueprint that we hope that government will follow for these transparency ethics and accountability recommendations because it really was. Um, and, and I think that's important um, to note just because you know you you are looking for uh, recommendations and solutions that are practical, bipartisan, you know, realistic. Um, and I think the fact that so many organizations participated in Accountability 2021 really does indicate that they, these are recommendations that um, lawmakers uh, and folks in the executive branch policymakers should look very seriously at. So I do want to, you know, give a plug for the um, the breadth and scope of the folks who created that report. Uh, because I do think it's important. Now, in terms of the the gaps in in transparency, sort of the the obvious um, you know problems that we're facing, you know, at Open the Government, obviously we are primarily focused on transparency, um, and we do think that there are some some pretty straightforward problems. Um, you know, I think that we saw during the Trump administration that we need to know more about the um, finan potential financial conflicts of interest. Uh, you know, in that our elected officials may hold. Um, so, you know, um, we need to we need we need tax reform, tax reports, ethics reports, those kinds of things really just need to be proactively made public so that we know if there's conflicts of interest and we can fight corruption. Um, I think another sort of very straightforward um, problem that we are trying to address is um, uh, the Freedom of Information Act problems. Now, I think that there, again, there's a lot of proactive disclosures that we shouldn't even have to ask for in the Pre Freedom of Information Act. We should be able to know sort of calendars, you know, um, of, uh, meetings um, with lobbyists, that kind of thing of the executive branch. And I won't even get into Congress because we all know FOIA doesn't apply to Congress. And I don't think that that's a, a uh, uh, reform that we're going to get anytime soon. Um, but, um, but I do think that there's a lot of proactive information that agencies could just release. Um, so I think that, you know, we really do need to address FOIA. Um, I think here too, I, we would agree that more spending transparency is absolutely necessary. Um, you know, the, the, the reason for transparency is never for transparency's sake. We don't want to just divulge information just for the heck of it. You know, heck of it. We really want to make sure that we know how government decisions are being made, whether those are spending decisions or policy decisions. And without transparency, we can't have that. Um, and that sets the stage for corruption. So that's um, that's a couple of the things. So FOIA reform, I think, and spending transparency are just you know two very straightforward. I think should be unobjectionable um, reforms that everybody can support across the board. So I will stop there. I could probably go on um, in more detail, but I'll let other folks have a chance. Sure. Well, so um, and I'll jump to you next. You are the in this same report. You are the co-lead for the balance of power section. And I thought, you know, particularly, especially with some of the work our street has focused and looked on in that section of report, it, it talked about separation of powers issues. And, you know, in the report mentions that it has shifted over the decades as Congress has acquiesced to presidential power, grabs that expand the li limits of their authority. And in that part of the report, it offers a number of reforms, but in thinking about current controversies, perhaps with the, the last year or so of the past administration, and in the early weeks of the current administration, what are some of the examples that are most sticking out to you currently? Well, I mean, I think that um, it, one thing to note about that section of the report is that many of the, the um, many of the recommendations there um, are, are to, for Congress to reassert powers it once had and has given away. Um, and and we, have seen, um, we have seen the consequences of that really acutely in the last few years um, around, you know, power of the purse, something, you know, the, the power of the purse act, um, which has now been subsumed in the protecting our democracy act, which I know that our street and uh, NTU have, have endorsed and um, is, is, is part of the recommendations in accountability 2021. You know, this is a, um, it, it this is an area of the law that people, you know, outside of Washington may not pay that much attention to, but we have, in fact, seen, you know, an impeachment based on, um, based on a the president's uh, the president's abuse of the of appropriations, um, 
we have seen um, you know, disputes about funding the WHO um, and, how, uh, and how Congress, um, you know, Congress is supposed to be making decisions about how we respond to these sorts of national emergencies and the, um, and the president is, is seizing that power and doing so with um, a lack of transparency that, that um, you know, Lisa referred to that you know, could be answered with this bipartisan piece of legislation. Um, the National Emergencies Act, you know, we, we saw abuse of emergency powers by the Trump administration in, um, in diverting military funding for building the wall. Um, but you know, this, that, that's a problem brought to the fore in, in the last administration, but we have national emergencies right now that date back to the, date back to the Carter administration. Um, and, and Congress is continually allowing the use of these emergency powers and this emergency spending uh, without reining it in. And, you know, but both the Accountability 2021 Act and again, um, the Protecting Our Democracy Act um, give Congress tools for taking that power back um, that actually have broad bipartisan support. And, and fittingly, you're, you're mentioning the National Emergencies Act. And when we're talking about potential bipartisan ideas, specifically reforming the NEA, it seems to be one of those issues that has got really interesting bipartisan support, thinking back to the 116th Congress, where articles like the Article One Act that was in the Senate, you know, introduced by some, and supported by Senator Mike Lee. And then on the House side, a lot of enthusiasm among many Democratic members of the House. And when we're talking about maybe amending the National Emergencies Act, and you, you cited some of the, the more absurd scenarios where we have emergencies, which when we think emergency, we usually think temporary, but some date back to the Carter administration, what would some of the changes potentially amending the NEA actually do? And how would that actually kind of restore a little more sense of balance between what Congress is supposed to do and what the executive branch is supposed to do when it comes to dealing with actual emergencies and actual threats? Well, I mean, I think the, the most fundamental piece of the legislation is, is switching the default on, on how, um, how emergency powers are exercised. Right now, um, Congress can turn off an emergency, but functionally, it, it ends up having to override a presidential veto in order to do so, which is just an enormous barrier. The reforms to the NEA in Article I and in POTA, Protecting Our Democracy Act, would switch that, where an emergency um, you know, an emergency should be limited in time um, and the, the president's need to respond urgently should be limited in time. And so the, the, the Article One Act would cut off an emergency after 30 days unless Congress reapproves it. And there you have a, a, you know, a straight up vote. You don't have to override a veto in order to make the reasonable conclusion that the president has now had time to address an emergency and unless the emergency is actually continuing, we should go back to our standard process for legislating and responding to national concerns. Great. Now, um, on top of this really great comprehensive report, I also wanted to have Andrew join us today because he also recently wrote a report um, called the Budget Control Act of 2021, a roadmap for Congress. And that report discusses concerns about the national debts and band-aids Congress has used in the past. But also, I think importantly and somewhat on a similar theme addresses transparency and oversight issues as well, because an important part of that report really you know, laments the lack of congressional oversight and federal spending. And as the branch responsible for appropriations, what sort of problems has that caused generally for Congress and federal spending in general? For sure. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so uh, first, a, a quick note, uh, I'll, I'll just echo everything Anne said on Article One Act and National Emergencies Act reform. Uh, it's legislation that NTU also supports. Um, you know, I, I dug this up uh, the other day while doing some research. 31, or as of last year, 31 of the 58 national emergencies declared since 1976 are still in effect. Um, this is, uh, it's a bipartisan problem, although the most high profile cases of uh, abuse or what we would argue is abuse of National Emergencies Act provisions um, uh, came from former President Trump in terms of reprogramming money to 
uh, pay, uh, construct a border fence uh, on, uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border, which, which was obviously a major uh, breach of congressional power of the purse. Uh, we've also seen some troubling comments from uh, none other than Senate Majority Leader Schumer over the past few weeks, where he is advocating for President Biden to declare a national emergency on the climate and use National Emergencies Act powers to spend money on mitigating climate change. Now, you can believe that climate change is an urgent threat that requires bold action uh, from the federal government, but process does matter here and doing an end run around Congress and having the most powerful or one of the most powerful members of Congress advocating to for the president to do an end run around Congress, uh, I think should be concerning to Republicans and Democrats alike. So I think this reform is urgently needed. And uh, uh, I know Protect Democracy and our street are also supportive of, of, of these efforts. I think we're going to keep pushing that. And luckily, there is bipartisan interest in doing so. As for the budget process, uh, thank you for for sharing the paper with with um, with your listeners. It's, um, you know, uh, it, it probably does not take uh, someone who pays attention to, to Congress every day, like like the folks uh, uh, on this panel or maybe uh, uh, watching the event today to realize that the congressional budget process is broken. Uh, we see it with government shutdowns. We see it with Congress regularly missing their deadlines um, uh, on on actually, you know, uh, passing the spending bills necessary to keep the government open. Um, all of this uh, it impacts planning at the federal government level. It, uh, it often leads to wasteful spending, uh, shutdowns, uh, especially the, the lengthy shutdown that um, you know, uh, occurred in uh, 2019 going into 2020, or was it 2018 going into 2019? My brain is mush now. But um, uh, the, the lengthy shutdown we had cost the economy uh, billions of dollars. Um, you know, Congress, uh, Congress is really bad at meeting its budget deadlines, uh, even though these are set in statute, they're set in law. Uh, Congress is regularly late when it comes to, or, or just simply doesn't do the work when it comes to passing a budget resolution every year, when it comes to uh, passing appropriations bills with enough time for federal agencies to plan and for the money to sort of get out the door in time. Uh, two related problems, which which um, I, I go into in the paper, uh, you know, uh, some folks maybe don't necessarily realize, um, but, uh, you know, the, the these massive spending bills that we pass every year, you know, 1.3, 1.4 trillion dollars, it's about uh, it's about 30 percent of what the federal government spends every year. Sixty percent is on mandatory programs, mostly Social Security and Medicare. These are, of course, critical, important programs, but um, with that much spending on autopilot, there are concerns over, uh, you know, congressional oversight. Is Congress, um, is Congress uh, providing enough scrutiny, scrutiny for these programs? Are they planning ahead enough for the uh, coming shortfalls in the Social Security and Medicare trust funds, ensuring that these programs uh, are solvent and will last for decades, if not generations? Uh, there, there are numerous concerns there. Now, um, there are also concerns over uh, expired or expiring authorizations uh, for some of these programs. So Congress has um, the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan agency, puts out a report every year on expired or expiring authorizations. And uh, I believe their latest report counted um, uh, some 1,000 uh, authorizations of appropriations that are expired or expiring uh, programs across the federal government, discretionary and mandatory spending that haven't been re-scrutinized, reassessed, reviewed by Congress in months or years or sometimes even decades. And uh, it's just all evidence of, of Congress um, uh, not quite fulfilling its duties on either the mandatory spending side of the ledger, which makes up 60% of total federal spending, or the discretionary side, which makes up 30% of uh, federal spending, the other 10% is is net interest on the debt. Um, all of this compounds to um, not only make our debt and deficit situations worse, worse and post-COVID, they'll be in an even more precarious situation than pre-COVID, but it also means that Congress is uh, 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 sleeping at the wheel, so to speak, uh, when it comes to its, its power of the purse, constitutional power of the purse authorities. So these are all overlapping problems. Look forward to discussing them more, but uh, um, th there's a lot to be concerned about here. Thanks, Andrew. And I'm going to turn quickly to actually one of the questions that was submitted from one of the listeners. And I encourage anyone, if you have any questions for our panelists, there should be a little Q&A button at the bottom for the Zoom webinar, and you can feel free to put any questions there. 
and we'll try to get as many of, of them as we can. So this one is, um, this question is concerning IGs. And the, the listener was interested in hearing more about what Congress can do to protect truth tellers who blow the whistle and support IGs. Um, so what are certain kind of what are certain issues that are lacking in this field and what are certain things that Congress could actually look to and promote in this Congress? Um, I mean, I can start. Uh, there's a couple of um, things that we really need to to focus on with, with IGs, and I will say that um, again, Accountability 2021 does address them. Um, we certainly would endorse supporting um, improvements to the Whistleblower Protection Act. Um, that would that's not exactly um, related to IGs, but to whistleblowers more broadly, um, so that uh, whistleblowers are um, uh, protected from retali uh, retaliatory at retaliatory actions um, and personnel practices, and um, you know there's just they have more protections if they if they do blow the, the whistle. Um, uh, on wrongdoing that they see, we really need that to um, to to you know um, to be stronger. And I think that there's probably a lot of support for that. Um, at least I would certainly hope so. In terms of the IGs, um, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that we really want to focus on is that Congress should protect the integrity of IGs um, with legislation. Um, so, in other words, protect them against removal without good cause. Um, and uh, protect the identities of the whistleblowers that come to IGs during investigations. Uh, so I do think that um, at least for a start, that's um, you know that's a, an important uh, protection for IGs because they are obviously critical to addressing corruption uh, throughout government. And, and Anne might have more to add to that as well. I mean, the the most important piece that I would add is is that. That, that for cause protection, as well as a number of, of provisions to strengthen um, the, in, the integrity and independence of IGs is included in the Protect Our Democracy Act. Um, and you know, so Congre Congress has the language right there, right now, um, and, um, and the, the, the tools to, um, to you know, empower um, this really essential component of government oversight. I'll add to that. Um, so I agree with everything that Lisa and Ann said. I'll, I'll also add to that that I think in order for the legislative branch to continue uh, conducting its proper oversight role and to enhance their oversight role, there need to be the right procedures and practices in place in every House office, every Senate office, every committee uh, on Capitol Hill when it comes to uh, intaking whistleblower disclosures. Um, uh, luckily, the House recently formed an Office of the Whistleblower Ombuds, which uh, is specifically tasked with, with ex exactly this, um, this mission to help train uh, uh, House staff uh, on, on, you know, again, properly, properly managing whistleblower concerns, uh, uh, receiving complaints, protecting the, the uh, identity of, of, of people who blow the whistle uh, within government. And uh, you know we'd love to see an office in the Senate, but that office it, it, it's a it, it's a small group of experts, but they're already doing good work uh, on, on Capitol Hill in, in terms of making sure that every congressional office is properly trained in uh, in protecting whistleblower rights. And uh, I think that's going to be especially critical with some of the extraordinarily large programs that Congress has passed uh, in, in recent COVID bills. It's a lot of money going out the door. Taxpayers uh, their their investment in these programs needs to be protected and folks who have the courage to blow the whistle on waste, fraud, or abuse need equally robust, if not more robust protections. And uh, these bills that Lisa and Ann mentioned, along with the work of this House office, uh, are going to help on, on all of that. I want to add one more thing on that point, if I can. Um, it, as a former oversight lawyer, I, I, I know in, on the, it, in the House, I know that work takes time. Um, it takes time. It takes expertise. It takes a lot of staff. Um, Congress has done a much, a much better, or at least a more robust job of funding the executive branch as of funding itself for a long time. Um, and, and I would actually encourage Congress to, to invest more in co congressional capacity um, so that it can exercise the, its check on the, on the executive branch in a more, um, more functional and consistent way. 
If we can, I want to kind of explore that idea a little bit more, Ian, that you mentioned about capacity, about this issue where Congress is very, very effective in funding in many of the priorities and initiatives of the executive branch. How does that add a little um, advantage for Congress and maybe improve some of its not only constitutional authorities, but good oversight functions by improving its capacity? And I guess if anyone, feel free to explain what would that entail and what sort of advantages does it serve? Well, I mean, a lot of it is is staff and salary. It is also resources. Um, you know, the the Congressional Budget Office and CRS. Um, you know, when when Congress doesn't have resources um, itself for oversight or for analysis, um, it looks outside. And you know, this is how this is how um, lobbyists and 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 various interests across <laughs> D.C. and elsewhere. Um, you know, leave a huge mark on 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 what on what happens in in Congress um, because Congress just has not given itself the capacity to do that work on its own. Um, so you know, really, it's it it's a matter of funding and investment. I think is the is the biggest piece. And I and so turning from that, I think one interesting aspect where you see a huge difference. Another large and significant difference between the legislative branch and the executive branch is sometimes, and many lawyers are familiar with this, you know, and we think about the federal legal system, we know the concept of precedent and how courts apply holdings of past cases to handle current disputes. But so this issue about the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, this office which often crafts legal opinions, they're adhered to by government officials but some of these opinions, including the most controversial or important, are not necessarily public, not even the Congress. So what sort of problems does this create? Um, and perhaps, um, Lisa, you might be the one ready for this. And how does this impact Congress's relationship with the executive branch? I mean, that's definitely one of the key recommendations that, you know, that we include in and that Open the Government's been working, um, working on for some time is that Office of Legal Counsel recommendations are made public, our opinions are made public. Um, and I mean, you're exactly right. We have a body of secret law uh, that directs the president and the executive branch on you know, what, what they can and cannot do. It gives them permission for things that maybe we don't know that they have permission to do. And I think it's obviously, it seems so um, you know, counterintuitive to everything about democracy that there's this, this body of secret law. Um, and it just weakens uh, Congress's relationship vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch um, because the executive branch is just kind of going along with sort of cover uh, from, from the Justice Department OLC. Uh, and Congress, you know, really is, it's, it's, it's tied its own hands um, in that it doesn't know kind of what this major influencer is doing, um, you know, in terms of the Office of Legal Counsel. So, you know, we do advocate for transparency of that. We do think that that would help, you know, Congress uh, with its oversight role. But we, I think more fundamentally, I think that that's, it's, it's anti-democratic. Um, and so I think that we really need to focus on the democracy side of the Office of Legal Counsel having secret legal opinions. And I think that that's, um, it's, it's something that is, uh, you know, long overdue, and it's certainly not just uh, the, the past administration or the current administration. Um, you know, presidents for decades have been relying on OLC opinions, um, and again, Congress just has its hands tied in in trying to, uh, you know, trying to, to to figure out what's legal and what's not. Frankly, and, and, I, and I know there have been a, um, a number of proposed reforms and ideas. I know um, in the one section of the accountability report specifically talked talks about this idea of a new publication procedure where perhaps issuing draft opinions for notice and comment, like a, almost like a new regulatory tool. And so um, I mean, maybe perhaps, Anne, I think that was in your section. If you wanted to elaborate maybe on how that idea might be helpful, maybe how that helps with transparency and being able to talk as, and, or at least it describes as the, the secret law. Sure. I mean, I think, think one problem with the OLC is not just the secrecy, but also the sort of one way ratchet of executive power. Um, and, you know, the people we have writing these, these opinions are, um, you know, view the executive branch as their client, not the entire government and the opinions, um, you know, throughout 
administrations have gotten increasingly more pro-executive to almost to the point of, of, of ridiculousness <laughs> in the last administration, with res especially with respect to um, power vis-a-vis -vis Congress, you could have entities other than executive branch, uh, other than people entrenched in executive power, commenting on what is put forth, identifying the, the other interests at stake um, when when the Department of Justice is defining how it's going to operate, um, you know, you could have you could have people who who actually have an interest in you know Congress serving as a check, explain why that's important to a functioning government, um, and force uh, force OLC to answer you know some of the hard questions about what happens when the um, the view of executive power broadens and broadens and broadens over generations. And in, in talking about ratcheting, of course, you know, the kind of this idea of maybe stretching the ideas of Article II powers and building on that precedent and, and ratcheting it up. Is this the sort of scenario that where obviously we've seen Congress um, often in different battles with executive branch officials to get information and numerous, numerous disputes are often litigated. And is this the sort of thing where maybe does Congress need an equivalent OLC? Does there need to be almost a contrary legal view that Congress could establish? I'm curious if there are any thoughts of Congress almost having their own version of LLC. I, I, I've heard that that idea bounced around and and you know I think it I think it could be a good one. Um, I think that you know whatever Congress can do to sort of Put itself on on equal footing um, with with a co-equal branch in these sort of interbranch disputes would be would be helpful, um, you know. But I think but I think that you know there's the fundamental problem is is that the executive branch has been increasingly aggressive over time and without uh, without pulling that back, um, you know, Congress remains at a distance. And I would just have to add that if Congress does try to have its own OLC or version of it, those opinions at the outset, it must be clear that there's transparency of those opinions. Great. And so we, we got a couple more um, questions talking about different oversight mechanisms. And, and one listener in a couple different questions kind of goes back to this general theme of the GAO. And what, how can the GAO really service congressional oversight authority and how can that help Congress in kind of fighting back against some of these perceptions and, and arguable mistakes that Congress has made in the past? Well, I'll just start. I, I am hardly a, a GAO expert, but having read many of their reports before, I, I, I can maybe start with like a 10,000 foot level. And I don't know if, if Lisa or Ann, you'll have anything to add, but. GAO, uh, as as actually one of one of the questioners alluded to, GAO plays a really major role in in overseeing federal programs, in recommending uh, improvements and changes to federal programs that are falling short of their intended missions or potentially wasting taxpayer dollars. But um, folks outside of DC, outside of Congress, don't hear about GAO too often. So, um, you know, I. Um, some of some of the separate work we do on the Defense Department on, on the defense budget, uh, a lot of a lot of my work in the last year has focused on the overseas contingency operations account, the uh, which members across the ideological spectrum, members of Congress across the ideological spectrum have called a, a slush fund for uh, priorities that are actually not related to overseas emergency needs for the military. And, and that's really what the account has become in recent years. A lot. We released a paper that. Uh, uh, offered a bunch of short and long-term reform options for, for OCO, for the OCO account. And uh, a lot of the short-term reform options were literally just GAO recommendations that uh, we got members of Congress interested in um, uh, because they had been in a GAO, GAO report a few years ago and uh, you know there hadn't been any further congressional action. Uh, a good thing about GAO that I think government and non-government non watchdogs who, who, who may be uh, watching this this webinar should know is that they actually and it's something that I didn't discover until you know a little bit into researching GAO on a daily or weekly basis is is they keep a tally of their recommendations uh, uh, for various federal programs and and what federal agencies should do to improve them and they tally which ones are open and which ones are closed and they review that periodically every few months so that 
any 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 watchdog again government or non-government looking to improve a particular federal program can see what GAO has recommended uh, 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 federal agencies should improve upon and see the status of those recommendations. Uh, GAO, as, as, as some, some of your listeners may also be aware, releases a high risk list every year of uh, programs that are, um, uh, as the name would suggest, particularly at high risk for wasting taxpayer dollars or failing to meet, um, meet Congress's goals or, or intentions for, for, for a given program. And, that high risk list was just released um, uh, was just released a couple weeks ago. Um, it's an important part of, of again uh, federal oversight. I think um, you know given the good work that GAO does, I, I think there's certainly a case for increasing the staff, increasing the resources available to them. Uh, but the flip side of the coin is uh, we'd love to see members of Congress more engaged with GAO's recommendations. Uh, Congress should be working to either operationalize a lot of these recommendations, especially when they are legislative recommendations to improve programs, or uh, if there are programs where GAO tells the executive branch or federal agencies to make certain improvements, uh, Congress should really put the hammer down if it's been six months or a year or two years or five years and a federal agency has essentially stonewalled GAO on their recommendations. Not everything GAO recommends might necessarily be the best thing to do for a given federal program, but at minimum, those federal agencies owe GAO a robust response uh, or alternatives for improving federal programs. So that's a meandering answer, but just a few thoughts I have on GAO. It's a great agency. Uh, we should be using it. And we also shouldn't be allow be allowing um, the executive branch to to ignore it with respect to um, you know a, a couple of its its particularly designated purposes, which is in um, with respect to the Empowerment Control Act and the Anti Deficiency Act and the Vacancies Act, where we saw the last administration um, you know uh, reject reject GAO interpretations of of, of budget law and um, and direct its employees to to proceed with respect to um, funding decisions that GAO identified as illegal and you know continue to to uh, to Im Im continue to empower as an acting uh, DHS secretary um, Ken Cuccinelli who the GAO identified as as serving in violation of the Vacancies Reform Act um, you know these are two really key, uh, congressional oversight functions that the that the GAO plays that you know um, may seem obscure but were extremely important in the last several years. And, and so, kind of pivoting from that, I'll I'll address one more um, listener question. What are some ways that um, we can aid and encourage greater oversight or greater accountability? One one suggestion is maybe you know, as as the press been doing a sufficient job of this. Are certain organ, you know, we have a lot of our DC-based organizations that talk about this and often talk with lawmakers. What seems to be more effective, kind of this more kind of inside baseball strategy, talking with lawmakers, working a lot in DC, or maybe this broader, more uh, grabbing the attention of the public, or maybe a mix of both to raise this important issue. I mean, I'll go ahead and start. We a number of years ago. It, 20, it must have been in 2017, Open the Government did a did some public opinion research, some polling on trust in government. And um, I will say one of the uh, most consistent findings sort of across party was just the frustration of people to really impact change. Um, people knew they could go to vote, uh, but they didn't feel that they had any other way to, to, to make change in government. And then one of the most problematic um, accountability um, issues, I think, that people flagged, uh, and again, this was four years ago, things might have changed, but at the time was um, just frustration with uh, elected officials not doing what they say they're going to do. Um, and to them, that was a key accountability problem. Um, I say this, not that I have any idea how to fix that, um, obviously, but, um, but I think that there's, um, there seemed to be a real desire on the folks that we polled to have more say, to have more power. Um, so I do think if there was a way to raise these issues, um, you know, uh, in the public uh, arena, you know, it couldn't hurt, right? Um, 
all of that is to say, though, nobody, I don't, I don't think folks really vote, you know, pro or, or con accountability, right? It's not a thing that's like a top tier issue that people go and vote on. Um, but if there was a way to kind of elevate the issue among sort of the general public or, you know, more grassroots organizations, so that elected officials know it's not just those of us inside the beltway that this matters to, but that it matters to their constituents, um, you know, I think it would be tremendously helpful. Um, and, and I think that there's, you know, there would be some interest in that. Um, Open the Government did a FOIA training program uh, for sort of basically grassroots people who just had no idea how easy it was to make a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, and I think that, you know, that was well received. And I think, again, it's just a sign of that we in DC have to do a better job um, letting the public know that there are ways to participate and there are ways to get their voices heard um, and, and all these accountability issues. And one thing members of Congress could could consider doing to great effect is is oversight locally. Um, you know, when I was when I was on the Hill, um, I, I worked for the Energy Commerce Committee and we we held a field hearing in West Virginia after an enormous chemical plant explosion there. Um, and really focused our oversight efforts on the local community, which was which was helpful to members on our committee. Um, and you know, bringing 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 the importance of oversight home, um, you know, could do some of the the work that Lisa is is uh, reflecting on. And um, you know, I I think. One one joke I make all the time as I'm I'm talking to to folks on the hill is that that despite graduating with a degree in political communication, I'm actually a terrible political communicator, and I am a worse political communicator the more I work on policy. There are no, there are I don't think there are any single issue voters out there on the Empowerment Control Act. Uh, there's maybe one single issue voter on uh, uh, so-called apportionment reform at the Office of Management and Budget, and Anthony, it's our friend Dylan Hedler Gaudet at Project on Government Oversight, who does great work on this issue. Um, but there are ways to make the to, to, to your question, Anthony. There are ways to make these issues um, plain and explicable to folks who are not steeped in the minutia of, of policy and and law um, every day, and and. I honestly, the, the, the empowerment example with, with former President Trump and the impeachment trial are a great example of that. You know, most Americans, if you pulled them, would probably not be able to tell you what the Empowerment Control Act is, but uh, a lot of Americans thought it was wrong that Congress, which controls the nation's purse strings, appropriated money to go to Ukraine, uh, and the president held that up and did not give a good or legal reason for doing so. Uh, that is pretty plain and clear to people, and so when it comes to when it comes to Congress exercising its proper oversight role, I think Anne's point on you know making it local, bringing it home is is one great way to do it. But there there are definitely ways, both high profile examples and examples that hit closer to physical or, or theoretical homes for people uh, to uh, you know connect connect the policy to the 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 politics uh, of it without um without again getting into the minutia that that would would put uh a lot of people uh uh to sleep uh, <laughs> uh not to not not to diminish the the important work we do but uh again as 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 someone who who used to study political communication now does policy um i i find myself always struggling to uh uh bring it home for for most people uh uh and and yeah i still think there are effective ways to do so and I think this this somewhat uh, aligns some um, with some of the more questions and comments that we've gotten from other listeners as well, people who are tuning in. One person suggests, well, really, this, this could be an image problem. And of course, we're not the expert political communicators. But it seems often when people think oversight kind of was talk about oversight, and often people just can think of it as maybe exposing corruption or certain mismanagement, or maybe there's one particular scandal and not necessarily an oversight of a larger systemic problem. And then second, someone is suggesting, well, maybe one of the problems that, we'll, that we see sometimes is sometimes when we do these serious oversight issues, it's not gonna get the same attention or coverage as maybe more scandalous or dramatic congressional hearing would get. And different, how could you maybe address that difference? And I think Anne brought a really interesting point about bringing that issue home. And, and taking that hearing to another place in, in West Virginia, whether where there was a right afterwards, um, a terrible incident. 
So if anyone had any other suggestions on, you know, kind of what Anne was suggesting, bringing the issue home or kind of, or Andrew was um, talking about as well is trying to explain in more um, simple terms why this matters to people. And, you know, kind of maybe some of the stuff seems more abstract, but actually how it applies to many people in their everyday lives. Well, I just want to, um, one thing I want to clarify, because because uh, I, I fear or worry that I came across the wrong way. It's not, you know, I, I, I want to avoid, you know, especially when I'm communicating about these things, uh, suggesting that folks outside the Beltway are, are somehow, you know, not of the same caliber uh, uh, that, that we are here working on policy in D.C. or in the D.C. area. Um, it, it, it's just, it is very easy um, when you are reading congress.gov and reading uscode.house.gov and reading GPO documents and GAO documents all day. It's, it's, it's really easy to get into, fall into the trap of acronyms and legalese. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is why all of our organizations have communicators, people who are responsible for translating that into, you know, uh, it, into into terms that uh, you know anyone uh, would see and understand on the evening news or the morning news, and and so um, you know I think your I think your listener uh, I think your listeners and and the folks asking questions raise good points, right? Uh, uh, shifting this to more focusing on on corruption um, uh, than you know the, the more nebulous term of oversight. Look, look as an example at uh, Representative Katie Porter, who has become uh, uh, somewhat of a star on Capitol Hill and, and has gone viral on social media uh, uh, more times than I can count for her whiteboard breakdowns in, in oversight hearings. Uh, some would say she has made oversight cool. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, and that's not to say, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I, my organization and, and me as an individual, I, I share, you know, I, I have a fair share of disagreements with Representative Porter on all sorts of policy matters, but you can't deny that she is extremely effective at oversight um, and that she asks the right questions and that she does so in a way that resonates with people. That's where you see, you know, her, a video of her uh, dressing down someone uh, who, you know, I don't know, say it's a business CEO who, who defrauded uh, customers, you know, dressing them down uh, and, and, you know, that video getting, you know, 50,000 or 80,000, uh, you know, likes on, on Twitter. And, and you know, uh, obviously social media is not the only barometer of are you reaching people um, in an effective way? And sometimes it can actually be, um, uh, you know, counter to effective, but, uh, but, but, Representative Porter, I think, has 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 shown a, a path forward that that um, steers away from political showboating and and uh, which we sometimes do see in oversight hearings, and really focuses on making some of these issues plain and uh, plain and clear to to uh, most uh, of her constituents and most of the people watching, and um, connects for people why government oversight is so important. I want to pick up on on that thread there, um, and you know, with both the sort of uh, juxtaposing what what Katie Porter has done and and the political showboating that you see sometimes. You, Katie Porter has done her homework, and I assume that her staff has too. Um, and you know, I want to take that back to the congressional capacity point I made earlier. You know, it's it's a lot easier to do a political showboat hearing. Um, where you just write some talking points and and you know like yell across the aisle um, than it is to do a really significant um, oversight hearing. But when you do, you know, there have been. I mean, think about the the you know the oversight hearings during the financial collapse um, with with Wall Street executives um, being confronted with emails about you know selling junk to their to their clients um the the deep water horizon explosion there were several pretty blockbuster hearings with, um related to to those that actually made you know front page new york times um but they only they were only able to do that because they invested a lot of of staff time and resources and you know i i happen to know that it was mostly like burning midnight oil if um if congress could if if there was a 
a, a deeper commitment to, to staffing committees in a way that allowed them to do that kind of oversight more consistently and not only in emergencies. Um, you know, I think that would be more interesting for people to see. And and one of the and one of the questions, and then we'll pivot for the last uh, five or ten minutes that we have talking about a lot of the kind of the district offices and the opportunity for constituent services, and maybe the if anyone wants to comment quickly on maybe the types of stories and information they can get through their constituents that way, and then also and again I am and I'm turned to kind of the bringing the hearing home and, and having these hearings in different places and the opportunity to talk about these issues to really, really relevant things that have happened. If so again, if, if there's anything kind of, kind of a strategy there for congressional offices to really take advantage of their local offices to talk about these issues and to conduct better oversight ultimately. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, oh, I, I, it doesn't matter, you wanna go ahead. Either way, it doesn't matter. I just wanna say, I mean, I do think, you know, pivoting off what everybody else said, um, we, as this sort of inside the beltway accountability community, we do a terrible job talking about these issues. And I think that, um, you know, and connecting the dots. Um, and I think Anne's point is, is brilliant and really well taken that we do need to bring it home um, to, to folks at home. So, um, but we also need to really think about what accountability means to people at home. And I think this all, you know, comes together again with, with, with making these, um, making our work relevant to, to people's everyday lives. So um, it was actually one of my staff who said it pretty well, basically that, you know, accountability to us might mean, um, you know, an IG report on the transfers of military weapons to local police departments. Um, but that's not real accountability to the people who are maybe facing these tanks, you know, rolling down their streets. Um, so we need to really take it further as, as an accountability community and talk about those things. And I, you know, I bring up police departments because I think that's a really great way to bring accountability home to people. Um, because every community has one um, and and there's probably a lot to uncover, right, um, to, to keep those police departments accountable. But that's just one example. Um, but I, I love that idea. I endorse that idea. I want to try to figure out a way to, you know, to, to, to push for that because I think it makes perfect sense. Um, but I think as a community of accountability experts, you know, we need to, to figure out if our messages are, are even making sense. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a, a place to start. And in our final minutes, I kind of want to leave uh, everyone on a good note and, you know, and looking at this from a glass half full perspective. And I'm curious, and, you know, I, I think of issues, for example, like um, war powers and AUMF, where you've seen maybe from the outside, like, well, it seems like really strange duos or maybe really strange you know, groups of people that might seem ideologically very different um, uh, you know, looking back, but maybe once you look in the details, like, oh, well, there is some consistency and some logic that comes to this. And, and the number of issues we've talked about, budget, LLC, IGs, FOIA, all the number of topics that, Andrew, you mentioned in your report, that Lisa Ann and many other organizations participated in the Accountability 2021 report. Are there kind of maybe unusual alliances or kind of this interesting bipartisan momentum that you're starting to see that maybe others haven't yet that kind of leave you optimistic for really implementing some change either in this Congress or in a future Congress? Well, I mean, I think we're seeing a pretty unique political moment where, you know, the, the, the previous Republican administration um, it made clear just how dangerous and uh, a, a supercharged executive can be. And there's a little bit of hangover among Democrats um, who, who, you know, are still, um, are, 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 are still looking to prevent something like that from happening again. While you have um, Republicans in Congress who are looking at a newly elected Democratic president and thinking, you know, maybe robust executive power isn't so great. Um, and you might, you know, like maybe that may be more, I hope that's not cynical. Um, I, it's, it, it, I mean it to be optimistic. Um, I think that we, I think that we actually have an opportunity to, to seize this moment, um, to see, to see some real change. Um, and I'm, I'm actually feeling quite hopeful that that something like the accountability 2021 recommendations and the protecting our democracy act could actually, um, really happen. 
Um, yeah, I'll add, I, I, I am cautiously optimistic because a lot of the, a lot of the elected Republicans who were perhaps most vocally out front supporting Donald Trump, folks like Lindsey Graham, uh, uh, are nonetheless supportive uh, and were supportive even in, in some cases during the Trump era of efforts that would uh, hold the executive branch more accountable to the legislative branch. That is not, you know, that is not to suggest a political pass uh, to, to, to these members on everything, uh, uh, but it is encouraging nonetheless that again, for example, Senator, Senator Graham, other Republican senators have long supported ensuring that the Office of Management and Budget, which is now Biden's OMB, was Trump's OMB, has to report when they make these spending decisions, uh, stuff like uh, impounding federal funds or apportioning federal funds that they, they member, there are members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that are supportive of, of making sure that, um, that that is uh, reported in a public and transparent manner and that aberrations are, are uh, explained to Congress. Um, I'm also cautiously optimistic, and perhaps I'm being a little too naive here, but uh, President Biden is the first president we have had in, in a generation or more who spent as much time in Congress as he did. I believe the last uh, president who spent that much time in Congress uh, was maybe Gerald Ford, maybe Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and so I hope that President Biden, even if he's not necessarily cheerleading for some of these reforms that would take power away from him and his branch of government, uh, I hope he at least doesn't stand in the way of them if there's enough congressional will and support, because I think President Biden, more than any other president we've had recently, uh, understands uh, the critical role Congress plays um, uh, in our federal government generally, and then specifically when it comes to congressional power of the first. Um, and I just really quickly add that in terms of room, reason for optimism for bipartisan cooperation, the Freedom of Information Act reforms that we've been working on and others have been working on um, historically have bipartisan support. Uh, we've never understood why Freedom of Information Act should be partisan. Uh, so we're, we're optimistic that um, that, uh, you know, that will continue and we'll see, see some bipartisan re uh, support for reforms there. Great. Well, we're nearly at the top of the hour, so I will leave it there. But I recommend that people do check out the Accountability 2021 report um, and the Budget Control Act of 2021 report by NTU. Both, both of those reports, including a lot of R Street's thoughts and comments on some of these very similar issues, are both on the um, original event announcement. All of those are linked there. Um, thank you again to the panelists for joining us for this hour. I think it was very informative. I think we left on a more positive note and understanding this important issues, some of the issues that we can handle or potentially tackle in the 117th Congress and ways to improve our oversight capability. So again, thank you very much. And then thank you everyone for listening and tune in for next month for another congressional topic and for many of the events that our street continues to hold. So with that, for people in the DC area, enjoy the weather and we will see you all again soon.